Warhammer 40k is a franchise that is absolutely chock full of secretive and mysterious factions that most of the community doesn't even know exist. Now, the Space Marines are no exception to this, as although most of us can probably name the 18 different Space Marine legions, it's a rare individual that can name all of the hundreds of chapters and or warbands that either currently exist or have existed at some point in the history of the Imperium. And if I'm being completely honest with you, most of those obscure chapters that don't get talked about nearly enough end up being way more interesting than the ones that we all already know about. So today we're gonna to be talking about four obscure Space Marine chapters that you've probably never heard of. We're gonna be talking about a chapter of Space Marines whose entire purpose is to fight against the most horrifying enemies mankind has ever encountered. And for their own protection, their minds have to be completely wiped after each and every engagement. A Space Marine chapter that suffers from a genetic defect that causes their bones to grow out of control, manifesting into razor sharp retractable arm blades. A Chaos Warband that for all intents and purposes is the chaos equivalent of the Legion of the Damned. Nobody knows who or what they are, but for some reason, all of the weapons, armor, and ships that they have are clearly human, but somehow futuristic, and nobody knows how they got them. And finally, we're gonna talk about a chapter of Space Marines that ritualistically allows themselves to be possessed by demons. They do this in order to exercise them and then be better suited to fight against the forces of chaos. However, it's what they do to the recruits that aren't able to pass this trial that makes them truly grimdark. We're gonna be talking about all that and a whole lot more, but first a quick shout out to this video's sponsor. And listen, I get it. It's, it's a controversial sponsor, I understand that. But in my defense, Warhammer is an expensive ass hobby. I'm addicted to plastic crack and audiobooks, and someone's gotta pay for all that. And it might as well be them. So roll the tape. Head game maker Crayplay invites you to play Hyper Fever. Critics call it the most mobile of all mobile games. Build a unique character from our preset warlords in the only real-time card strategy MMO that lets you play offline, online. Game Hub hails it the best FPS city builder we've ever played. Relax with bubble popping match three roleplay as you engage in casual hardcore battle royale. Go yeah, okay, wait a minute, no, cut it out. Stop, stop the tape, stop the tape. I can't shill for this. That is the most ridiculous, stupid thing I've ever seen. I need an actual good sponsor for my lore videos. Something that's a game that's actually fun to play. A sponsor like Raid Shadow Legends. If you somehow haven't heard of it yet, Raid Shadow Legends has completely taken over the gaming world, as it's the first game to bring a true console level experience to your phone. Explore millions of champion combinations and master countless tactics as you take on raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and PvP arena matches. With hundreds of artifacts to equip on over 600 champions, you can build your team and raid your way. No matter who you are, raids got a faction that you're going to absolutely fall in love with. Even for someone like me who is super picky and can never really decide if I like Beastmen, Lizardmen, or the Undead more. As Raid has all three of them and lets me mix and match as much as I want to get the perfect squad. The big news in Raid this month is Call of the Arbiter, which is going to be super hot. Raid Shadow Legends itself is getting updated with a load of cool new content related to the limited series. We're talking new champions, an artifact set, events, and a whole lot more. There's even a whole load of champion bios that have just been added to the game, so if you're someone like me who's obsessed with lore, this is going to be big. With all of this exciting stuff and more coming to Raid, if you haven't started playing yet, then what are you waiting for? Use my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen to get insane bonuses. We're talking an epic champion Drake, as well as four energy refills, a skill tome, and an XP booster. All of this amazing stuff will be waiting for you right here. So just hit the link in the description and I'll see you on the battlefield. Big thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. The Warp Ghosts are probably one of the most mysterious Chaos Space Marine warbands that currently exist in the lore, and what makes them really interesting is they very well may be one of the most important as well. We really don't know too much about these guys. We don't know what legion they descend from, what time period they were created in, what their ultimate goals and ambitions are, or perhaps even most mysteriously, what they even are. Nothing about them seems to make sense, and the best source that we have on them comes from a strange encounter during the Black Legion novel by Aaron Dembski Bowden. I don't want to spend too much time in this video giving an entire summary of the book, so all you need to know is that this takes place before the first Black Crusade, and Abaddon and his Black Legion are for the very first time attempting to break free from the Eye of Terror back into real space. They're not alone in their endeavor, as there is a Warlord of the Death Guard, known as Derevac, that is attempting to do the same thing. Derevac's fleet, by comparison, is vastly more powerful than Abaddon's. He has more warriors, more ships, and an enormous amount of resources at his disposal. Both of the fleets have become becalmed in the warp, right outside of the entrance of the Eye of Terror, so neither of them can move forward and actually break free. 
It's then that they decide to have a meeting on a nearby planet to discuss terms. It's not really a parlay, a peace treaty, or any kind of real negotiation, as Derevek realizes that Abaddon's in no position to negotiate, and Derevek is simply here to make demands. He wants ships in exchange for not attacking them. It's during the meeting, however, that something really strange happens. A new fleet appears out of nowhere in between both of the others. Abaddon's sorcerer, Iskandar Kane, looks up and remarks that the ships are incredibly bizarre. They don't really seem to make a lot of sense. They have enough in common with other Imperial ships that they are very clearly of human origin, but none of them are able to recognize what exact pattern they are. They're not from the present, and they're not even from the Horus Heresy era. They're clearly much more advanced and almost futuristic. One by one, every ship in both of the Chaos fleets reports that they have suddenly been boarded, which should be impossible, or at least it would require a full-scale assault. But on each and every one of them, a single lone space marine in gray armor with no recognizable symbols has appeared out of nowhere. As the reports start to come in, both sides believe that the other has broken their momentary truce, so the high-tension situation is in danger of reaching a breaking point. It's just then that another one of these gray marines appears on the horizon and starts to walk towards the group. I'm going to read for you the passage from the Black Legion novel where this occurs, and just for context, it's Iskandar Kane, Abaddon's personal sorcerer, that is narrating. I looked between the two opposed, confused groups of warriors. One by one, they turned to stare across the dusty garden with its eroded statuary, where a lone warrior walked from the Eldar ruins. He was dead. I thought that at once, as easily if I had seen decaying flesh or smelt the rotting musk of decomposition. To my sixth sense, he was without a soul, a man disconnected from the mechanisms of life, and yet he walked closer, his armor the light gray of an overcast sky, tinged by the faintest pale green, his eye lenses red-lit from within. He was no demon, demons had no souls, yet they are presences in the warp. They are the warp itself, and form writhing, drifting things before my psychic gaze. Yet he was no human, humans have shining souls, and they are beacons in the warp's tumultuous night. Whatever this warrior was, he walked the line between mortal and immortal, fused with the warp, yet not born from it, saturated by the immaterium, yet not possessed by it. He had a soul. I saw as he drew near, and it was still his own, a weak thing, a dim and shredded light. There was a beauty in that, in the same way a lesser mind, reliant on the five mundane senses, might see beauty in a color never before seen. Here before me was a kind of entity I had never believed possible, taking the form of a brother legionary. What legion or chapter had sired him, I could not say. His armor was of a mark unknown to me then, not even matching the newer suits of Aquila pattern battleplate that I had seen aboard the Black Templar's vessel. The Grey Warrior turned his helmed head to each in turn, showing no favor either way. The voice that emerged from his helmet grill was deep, though not unusually so for a legionary, and his words were preceded by a click of Vox projection, just as any of our voices were. I am Saronus. Within his words, I heard the telltale flow of respiration. He was dead to my sixth sense, yet alive to all others. My fascination deepened. Had he been one of us before undergoing these changes? Was he still one of us, but with mutations of the soul that set him apart? The icon in his pauldron was not one I recognized, but it was nevertheless gravid with symbolism. Two skulls set within an eight-spike disc, one looking to the left and the other to the right. An inscription ringed the staring skulls, cast in dark silver, and written in an unfamiliar dialect of High Gothic, in Abisso Talimus Eniabus Damanatus. The exact translation evaded me, but I could make out its meaning. We bear the souls of the damned through the depths. The conversation that plays out here is admittedly cryptic and mysterious. Now, basically, every question that Derevek asks is met with the same line over and over. You speak irrelevancies. How did you reach us undetected? Where do your loyalties lie? Etc. Etc. Eventually, Abaddon asks if they will guide them out of the storm, and that gets the warrior's attention. He says that they will if they are willing to meet their price. Soronos reveals that him and the other Warp Ghost's main purpose is to guide other ships out of the Eye of Terror. And what's important to remember here is at this point in the timeline, the first Black Crusade has yet to happen. No Chaos fleet has ever been able to successfully break free from the Eye of Terror, but apparently the Warp Ghost have already mastered this ability and are able to assist others in the process. Soronos asks both sides what they are willing to sacrifice, and the Death Guard leader, who is like a fat, greedy king, tells him that he will give him whatever he wants. Ships, slaves, weapons, it didn't matter. 
He was so confident in his ability to utterly destroy the fledgling Black Legion that he would take them from his enemies and give them to the newcomers. Seranos acknowledges this and then turns to Abaddon and asks him the same question. After consulting with his sorcerer, Abaddon realizes that a sacrifice means nothing unless the individual is truly giving up something of value. A sacrifice was meant to hurt you. Giving something meaningless or something taken from another was just an offering. He speaks his offering to Seronos, and after hearing his words, 50 more legionaries of the Warp Ghosts materialize out of nowhere. They point their guns at Derevac, telling him that his offer had been refused, and that they would be assisting Abaddon and the Black Legion. We don't get to see what that sacrifice is until later in the book, but it's revealed that Abaddon was willing to give them bodies, flesh, living beings, and specifically those of psychers within the Black Legion and the psyker children of the fleet's human slaves. It is believed that whatever the Warp Ghosts actually are, they do not have bodies of their own and must inhabit living flesh that will eventually rot and decay. Thus, they need a steady supply of other psychically gifted individuals with which to bond with. The White Seer, Asher Kai, being one of the sorcerers that willingly agrees to go with Seronos and the Warp Ghosts. And mysteriously enough, although it's not directly confirmed here, it's heavily implied that Seronos was actually the future self of Asher Kai. To this day, we still don't have a very clear picture of what exactly the Warp Ghosts are, just that they're a mysterious spectral chaos warband that exists somewhere between life and death and has been instrumental in escorting Chaos fleets out of the Eye of Terror. Whatever their ultimate goal is still remains a mystery, but if it hadn't been for them, then the Black Crusades could never have happened. Although the exact nature of the Warp Ghost is still unclear, the true nature of another chapter known as the Black Dragons is much more glaringly obvious, and it's one the Inquisition is not happy about. Mutation is something the Imperium doesn't tend to look on fondly, and when it comes to the Space Marines, random mutation is something normally reserved for members of the Traitor Legions that have had prolonged exposure to the corrupting influence of the Warp. However, this is not always the case, and in fact, the Loyalist chapter known as the Black Dragons, a successor of the Salamanders created during the cursed 21st founding, is perhaps the best example of a mutant legion of Space Marines that has remained vehemently loyal to the Imperium. Although technically not all members of the chapter share these mutations, and many of them are indistinguishable from other salamanders, some of which not even sharing their characteristic jet black skin, a large percentage of them suffer from a defect in one of their implants known as the Osmodula, an organ that secretes hormones that affect the ossification of a space marine skeletal system and aid in the forming of new bone growth. During their development, this thing drastically alters the way in which an Astartes bones grow causing them to increase in size and strength, as well as fusing their ribcage into a solid bulletproof mass of interlocking plates. In the Black Dragons, however, the implant has gone completely berserk. Not only has it caused many of their members to grow to a size much larger than a typical space marine with far denser bones, but most peculiar of all, the organ seemingly doesn't know where to stop. The bones just keep on developing, becoming most visible in the form of outgrowths in the marine's skull, and long, bladed bones that jut out of their forearms. Bone blades that for many of the Black Dragons are actually retractable. A lot of their members even sport other dragon-like features, such as elongated fangs and black, scaly skin. The inside of their mouth is also said to be completely black, including their lips and inner cheeks, while also sporting a tongue that tapers into a point like a lizard's. The individuals that have been afflicted with such mutation are formed together in assault teams known as Dragon Claws. They sharpen their bone blades to a killing edge, and then sheathe them in adamantium to turn them into incredibly deadly close combat weapons. The reality of the Black Dragons is actually pretty sad, as many chapters refuse to fight alongside them due to their obvious signs of mutation, and it should go without saying that the Inquisition is definitely not fans of the chapter. They stretch their tolerance for mutation nearly to a breaking point. All Space Marine chapters are required to submit a tithe of their gene seed to the Adeptus Mechanicus. Most often this serves as an emergency backup if a chapter ever takes devastating losses and is on the brink of extinction, whereas it also serves a more practical purpose in that the Mechanicus can monitor the genetic health of the chapter as well as screen for corruption. Now, here's the weird thing about the Black Dragons. Despite their obvious mutation and their reluctance to hand over any genetic samples, without fail, every single time they have ever submitted their gene seed, it has passed every single genetic purity test the Mechanicus can throw at it. From the perspective of somebody just analyzing the data, there is no corruption or mutation at all within the Black Dragons. Which obviously doesn't make sense, considering they have giant bone blades growing out of their arms and horns sprouting out of their head. So what exactly is going on here? 
Well, many believe that this is only possible because the black dragons specifically are altering their own gene seed in order to encourage these mutations, as they don't view it as a negative. They don't do this with all of their members, and thus the gene seed they send back is taken from individuals who have not been subjected to the practice. As far as I'm aware, this is just a rumor, and we don't actually know the truth. On one hand, it calls into question what exactly a mutant is, because one could also make the argument that every single space marine could be seen as a mutant based on all of the implants and genetic augmentation they have undergone. You don't see regular old people running around spitting acid at each other. But considering that these are traits that the Emperor designed personally, they are not seen as mutations, but the blessed holy work engineered by the divine. Although the Black Dragons view their mutation as a badge of honor, the defect can quickly become a curse in extreme situations, as within the bowels of their ship are huge, muscled, slavering Black Dragons that are stuck in a permanent predatory rage. They have mutated into abominations resembling full-blown dragon men, and are chained up to be released on the battlefield to find final peace in a frenzied suicide mission. It's honestly pretty similar to what happens to the Blood Angels when they lose themselves to the Red Thirst. Despite the fact that I'm sure they would really like to, the Inquisition so far has not declared them excommunicate traitorous. But if they were to see what lies within the dark corners of their ships, let's say the resulting consequences would not go well for them. Although accusations of heresy have been thrown at the Black Dragons more times than anyone could possibly count, the truth is that they are one of the most fiercely loyal chapters in existence, and time and time again have demonstrated an almost fanatical resolve to protect the lives of the innocent. Such is the curse of being a Black Dragon, to vehemently defend an Imperium that doesn't appreciate them. If the Black Dragons are a chapter that is hated and feared by the Inquisition, then the Red Hunters fall on the completely opposite end of the spectrum. They are a chapter that is believed to have been made in the 31st millennium during the Second Founding. But other than that, pretty much everything about their lineage is unknown. We don't know how many of them there are, what legion they are descended from, or even where their fortress monastery is located. When we think of Space Marines in the Inquisition, we often gravitate towards the Grey Knights working alongside the Ordo Malleus, or the Death Watch working with Ordo Xenos. In both of those cases, however, those chapters are their own unique entities with goals and ambition that just often coincide with the Inquisition. Thus, they frequently work together and are often honor-bound to serve the Inquisition when they call for them. The Red Hunters, on the other hand, seemingly exist solely to be a tool of high-ranking Inquisitorial Lords. It's believed that they were originally created right after the Horus Heresy, with the primary objective of hunting down and destroying the Traitor Legions, and over time, the chapter itself has come to be almost synonymous with the Inquisition, as they are routinely called upon to face the servants of the Ruinous Powers and other enemies of mankind too horrible to mention. It's an uncomfortable reality that the Inquisition will often mind wipe or, in some extreme circumstances, completely purge entire regiments of Imperial Guard or other Imperial forces after they've witnessed the horrors of a full-blown demonic incursion, in order to keep such unholy knowledge from spreading. The things the Red Hunters are thrown up against make something like this look like child's play, and are said to be so utterly terrifying that the chapter itself is not immune to the practice of mind wiping. In fact, that's where a lot of their mysterious nature comes from as the line brethren of the chapter are routinely subject to mind wiping, a process that preserves their soul and any and all physical abilities while sacrificing their memories, skills, experience, and personality. Because of this practice, the Red Hunters have been honed into an absolutely ruthless and brutal chapter, with no higher goals or ambitions than to serve as an unfaltering blade for the Inquisition. Fun fact, the vehicles they use are absolutely covered in battle honors due to the numerous missions they've been used in. However, many of them have been deliberately scrubbed away, and of the ones that remain, there are no records to indicate what operations they were awarded for. It's a secret to everyone, even the Red Hunters that helm those war machines. Every glory they achieve and every victory they earn is wiped from the minds of those who brought it into fruition. All records of such engagements are purged, and they're not even permitted to be recorded in the chapter's archives. This isn't to say that no records of the chapter exist, as they have fought alongside many other chapters during particularly pivotal campaigns, such as the Siege of Vrax. But the truth of their most secretive and brutal solo missions, as well as the knowledge of the enemies they have fought against that are too unthinkable to be even allowed to exist as a memory, are facts about the chapter we probably will never know. The Red Hunters exist as a chapter that has borne witness to the terrifying eldritch truth of the universe and subsequently had it stripped from them 
as any who would hold on to these terrible secrets would inevitably descend into a bottomless pit of madness and insanity. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, the Exorcist chapter is one that goes in the completely opposite direction, specifically seeking out such terrifying truths in order to steel themselves against the corrupting nature of chaos. The Exorcists are a dark and brooding chapter of Space Marines, famous for the remarkable feat of them being virtually immune to corruption. Such a powerful ability in the grim darkness of the far future does not come for free as what they have to go through in order to achieve this is admittedly pretty horrifying. The Exorcist are one of a handful of chapters that can trace their origin back to the mysterious 13th founding or the dark founding, depending on who you ask, as most historical records of this obscure event are often contradictory. Even the Astartes within the chapter can't really be sure about the truth of their origins, and those who do have such knowledge maintain tight lips as not to draw further scrutiny upon the chapter. Which, considering this chapter is famously known for binding demons to themselves in order to further their powers against chaos, uh, the secrecy makes a lot of sense. If any Imperial agent ever found out what they were doing, the entire chapter would immediately be denounced as heretics. Because of the secrecy and the fact that the exorcists tend to show up whenever there is a large-scale demonic incursion, this has caused them to be seen with a lot of mistrust by other chapters, especially those of the Black Templar, which is ironic considering that both chapters are successors of the Imperial Fist and share the same Primarch, Rogel Dorn. In truth, they were one of the earliest Codex-compliant chapters derived from the Imperial Fist, and they quickly distinguished themselves as worthy scions of that legacy. They were adaptable and excelled in many different strategic challenges, whether that be fighting alongside other members of the Imperium or setting off on their own brutal crusades to bring death and destruction to the enemies of the Emperor. The chapter's history, however, would suddenly take a violent turn on the world of Totem IV, and their destiny would be changed forever. The world had been beset by demons of Zinch, and the Exorcists were one of the first to arrive to defend the planet. Shortly after landing, they immediately found themselves bombarded from every direction by demons. Yet, whether through a quirk in their genetics or by the divine protection of the Emperor himself, they were somehow able to overcome the pervasive corrupting touch of the sorcerers and demons upon this world. Enraged by the Exorcist's ability to wade off the mutagenic gifts of Zinch, one of his greater demons threw his entire psychic essence into the mind of the Exorcist Chapter Master, Enoch. Although at first, it seemed like the demon had successfully possessed the Chapter Master. Within his mind, the Chapter Master warred against the demon in a battle of wills, putting his own defenses to the test. This took a grave toll on his psyche, but in return, he was gifted with profound insights into the weaknesses of his foe, and his latent psychic ability even came into full bloom. In a feat of immense mental strength, he was able to reach out far away to his chief librarian, and the two of them managed to banish the parasitic demon from real space. Even for somebody like a Space Marine Chapter Master, banishing a greater demon that had possessed somebody like this was a really big deal, and it caught the attention of a radical inquisitorial sect known as the Plutonians. They had already developed suspicions around the chapter based on their unnatural spiritual resilience, going so far as to have their own spies infiltrate the chapter as one of their serfs. After receiving the spy's report on what had happened on Totem IV, the Plutonians moved quickly to relieve the Chapter Master of duty, capturing and interrogating him for months. It was only after a long period of interrogation, when no corruption was ultimately detected, that he was able to return to his chapter. However, during those months, the Plutonians revealed to Enoch their own crazy theories about possession, how it worked, and how it might be able to be used as a weapon against chaos. You see, the Plutonians believed that by allowing one to be possessed, they could gain valuable insight into the nature of demons and how better to combat them. Although the theory did make some kind of sense, in practice, it was pretty impractical. It was nearly impossible for somebody to completely rid themselves of a demon's presence after they had become possessed. What the Chapter Master had managed to do was nearly unthinkable. But if the other members of the Exorcist had even a fraction of his spiritual resistance, they might just be able to turn this theory into reality. Enoch agreed with their theories and, in secret, struck a treaty with the Plutonians, pledging himself and his brothers to their cause. Through their combined efforts on the Exorcist homeworld of Banish, they conducted a program where in a foreboding factory known as the Halls of Tempering, each and every new Exorcist recruit, as well as all of the existing warriors, would be purposefully subjected to being possessed by a demon. 
Admittedly, these demons that were used were not quite on the same level as the one that had possessed the chapter master, but they were still incredibly powerful in their own right. After the possession was allowed to take place, the Inquisitors would monitor the situation carefully, before eventually driving the demon out and returning the host to the chapter for recovery and reflection. This is a practice that continues to this day, and most exorcist recruits are forced to banish the demon on their own. Those who are able to emerge triumphantly from this incredibly disturbing trial are rendered somehow even more fearless and resilient to demonic corruption. The possession gives each battle brother their own personal revelation into the nature of demon kind, which will serve them in all future engagements against the ruinous powers. We don't know the full extent of what the procedure does to any member of the exorcist, but they maintain a stony silence on all matters of chapter training and tradition. Willingly allowing yourself to be possessed by a demon in order to subsequently banish it and emerge more powerful than before is a pretty gnarly process when you stop to think about what they're actually going through. However, this is not the worst part of it, not by a long shot. You see, not all of the chapter's aspirants end up being successful, but it's important to note that if they've reached this point in their training, then they have received the chapter's gene seed and thus their innate spiritual resilience, making their bodies the perfect containment units for demonic entities. The chapter reasons that if these brothers are not able to serve them on the battlefield, then they will serve as a living jail cell for hundreds of different demonic entities. These individuals become so saturated with warp spawn that they are sustained in a state of deathless torture, their bodies enduring for centuries while their minds break apart. The exorcists refer to them as the broken ones and will serve as a containment unit for all of the harvested demons that the other initiates are able to successfully banish from their own bodies. This prevents the demons from returning to the warp and revealing the chapter's secrets to all the hostile sentients within the Immaterium. The broken ones are closely guarded by the chapter as if any one of them was ever able to escape, the results would be absolutely catastrophic. And those were four of the coolest and most obscure chapters of Space Marines that not enough people know about. Which one was your favorite and why? Do you think the exorcist binding demons to themselves is ultimately a good idea or do you think it's going to end up having some disastrous consequences in the future? Also, what about the warp ghosts? What do you think they actually are? Are they Chaos Space Marines from the future, Chaos Legion of the Damned, or something else entirely? Also, what's your favorite obscure chapter of Space Marines that you don't think gets nearly enough attention? Let me know all of your thoughts and ideas down in the comments section. I plan on making this into a regular series, so what chapters would you love to hear me talk about? This video ended up taking a little bit longer than I meant it to, so if I'm being honest with you, it's 5.30 in the morning as of the time of recording this, so I'm going to go to bed. I'll catch y'all in the next one.